everyone, it's Peter at Piss Imported Secret Laboratory. And for today's video, it is going to be partly academic, but um, after some deep thought, it came to me as to what I need to do to resolve my issue. So at that point, I guess this is not just an academic video, but it is a correct video that you can use and apply to your transmission if you want to. Um, so just to get down to brass tacks, I guess what happened was I went through the process of shimming my uh, final drive gear, fourth gear in my uh, ratchet top transmission. And everything I did was correct. And when I put it in the case, it worked perfectly. Um, so I was really happy about that. And what happened was after that is once I installed the main shaft in my case, it started to bind. So when I would turn this, um, you know, when I would turn this, uh, the shaft, it would start to, it would spin, you know, let me find a good example of what this would look like. It would spin, you know, uh, like, you know, real easy. And then it would start binding and then it would come loose and then it would spin for a little bit and then start binding. And what that told me is that the hole in my transmission case was not perfectly aligned with the other side of the case. Um, that would be from the factory. So when the factory cast the case and machined the bore or the holes, they were not aligned. And that's what was creating the binding situation when I would spin it. Now, originally, and you know what what happens in a situation like that, I should explain that, is that if this is, you know, if this is one way and this is just slightly canted, you know, like that, and we're going to exaggerate it, it's what is actually going to happen is it's going to wear out this bushing in your fourth gear uh, prematurely. And there were plenty of signs of a premature failure on my fourth gear when I took it apart, um, which is this one, the original fourth gear. And that bushing is just absolutely slaughtered in there. And it's because it wasn't straight with the, the main shaft. And I was, yeah, I, it absolutely devastated me that in order to resolve the issue, I actually had to undo all my shimming. And then it spins, you know, this has got it all in there and it spins great, you know, spins freely. Everything's great. Um, spins inside here. No problem. If I, you know, if I got it in neutral or whatever, it'll just sit here and spin till the cows come home, which is great, except for the fact that it's actually putting undue pressure on that bushing. Um, and the bushing is a soft material, so it's not going to take very long to wear that out. So, I mean, originally, you know, after I found all this out and put it all together, I was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to run it and it'll make it, you know, 20 or 30,000 miles, hopefully, before it absolutely destroys this bushing and then creates a monster leak that can't be captured or treated with anything. Um, and it will just leak. And, I, you know, I'm trying really really hard to make a shovel head that does not leak oil that is one of the pinnacles of this particular project in general that is one of the biggest challenges uh, that i sought to resolve when i built when i started this project so um so that's what i want to do and what came to me this morning when i was thinking about it is that they actually make uh, fourth gear bearing uh, races in oversized um, sizes. And why that is important 
is that I could not in my brain figure out a way to correct this alignment issue with using the existing bearing race, which is brand new. I put it in there and I line, line lapped it and whatever. Line lapping doesn't correct anything. All it does is just, I mean, the only thing it does is corrects the uh, irregularity of, of the roundness after you installed it. So, you know, it's not going to uh, correct correct a bore alignment issue but thankfully they do make oversized bearing races so you know in case they spin out or i guess for situations just like this one um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to strip this entire thing down again um but i'm not that far so you know it's not a big deal and I'm going to strip it down and I'm going to take my fourth gear and my case and I'm going to take it, you know, to a machine shop. And thankfully, I don't live very far from a place called Advanced uh, Cycle Machining in Superior, Wisconsin, who, you know, for most intents and purposes is considered one of the premier um, Harley machining shops in North America. So thankfully I don't live that far from them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring them those. I'm going to explain to them the problem and then they should be able to uh, align bore my case so that it's straight um, by using the oversized race that I, you know, that they'll get and and then that will resolve my issue and i'll have them uh you know do the line lapping and everything so that by the time i get it back it'll literally be ready to put together again um so i'm very very happy that that finally clicked in my head is that they made oversized races because now when i put this together i will know that I did the best job I possibly could, and it is as straight as it possibly can be, and it will last as long as it possibly can. Um, so, you know, what they're going to do is a base basically fix what the factory screwed up in the first place in 1976 by misaligning the bore when they drew when they made this case. Um, you know, and in order, since it's like a three hour trip, what I'll end up doing, um, you know, three hour trip up there is what I'll end up doing is I'll strip this and I'll, you know, pickle all the parts and set it aside. And then I'm actually going to move on to stripping my engine um, before I go so that when I go up there, I can bring them the heads and the bottom end and everything that I need to get repaired or machined so that everything is lined up perfectly and is in the right tolerances and i can assemble it um, at a level that will make me happy so um enjoy this next video know that uh it is correct so long as your case is aligned correctly um and you know don't forget to like and subscribe and thanks for uh watching and now to do this we're gonna get out our you know our uh shim you know our, our uh feeler gauges and what you do here is you want to find the largest feeler gauge set that you can fit into it Okay, so, you know, I don't even know what this one's at right now. I can't remember, but, and again, you didn't, I didn't tighten this down. So this is purely, you know, to show you how I did it. And, you know, the, I learned this method from uh, shimming gearboxes on Vespas, actually. So um, anyway, what you're going to do here is you're actually going to take your two feeler gauges and you're going to insert either one, one on each side. And that, and you want to keep going up in sizes until you can't fit them in opposite each other. And at that point, once you've found those, 
you know, write that number down and that's what your end play is right here between, you know, for four, between your uh, bearing, your bearing and, and fourth gear. Okay. And then once you have that number, you can go through and check your specs in the book. Um, this particular one, I believe is, oh, I don't remember. Let's look. All right. So this particular one is going to be, doo -doo -doo. So yeah, here, 0 0.0025 to 0 0.0135. So that's your drive gear end play. And that's your goal is to end up within those specs. Um, so once you have that, you, you know, your number on your shim, or your, excuse me, your feeler gauge, and, the, the, and you know the size of your shim, you can, you know, find out what size shim that you need to achieve that specification. So, um, you, know, you got your shim and this, and then you got your specification. So, um, so yeah, this is the first way that you can do it for the second way. We'll actually have to do it in the case. And that one is a little bit more common knowledge, let's say, um, but I'll show how to do that as well, just in case you didn't have to replace uh, the fourth gear bearing rate, outer bearing race. So, all right, so I'm not really going to do this because I've already done it with my feeler gauges and I know that it's right. Um, but I'll just quick explain how this is going to go. You're going to take, you know, once you get your all your bearings inside here, you're going to take your spacer and you're going to put that on and you're basically just going to mock it up like it's going to be, you know, running. You don't need the seal in place or anything like that for this. Um, then you're going to take your, uh, you know, small, the, the sprocket, put that on. Um, you're just basically assembling all the components and then you got your you know your tab washer and i just use that no matter what because it makes it uh it's just something for the nut to push against um since you're just mocking it up for a measurement you don't need to have your correct knot on here your super nut or anything like that um so then you you know put that on and then you grab your your giant socket and give this thing a couple of ugga uggas and uh and then that's all tight and ready to go and then basically what you need to do then is you got to get out your dial indicator. Um, and then with that, you can see mine's missing the tip somehow, probably came off of my lathe, but let's pretend that it's there. Um, and you're going to go down with your dial indicator and kind of set that in a way that is conducive to what you're trying to do here, which Oh, now my dial indicator is falling apart. Um, but anyway, so you'll set it. And normally what I would do in a situation like this, I'd try to you know, just pick a spot like right here on the face of this. Um, and then what you're, you're actually measuring here is the in and out movement. So then you're going to measure how much you know, this moves. So you push it all the way in and then put it up against your dial indicator and then pull it out. And that'll, you know, your dial indicator will respond to that. So you're going to push it in and then pull it out. And then however much, you know, that indicates in this way movement is how much play you have um, and whether or not that's within spec. And if it's not within spec, then you have to get different spacers for the back of this to take up that space to put it into spec. So that is the second way to measure the fourth gear end play. So I figure I better explain how you achieve or figure out what size shim that you need for this. So um, we're just going to kind of pretend here and we're going to say exactly, you know, how we would come up with a number. So. 
the first thing you do is you measure this, okay? And then let's say that this is 0 0.06 inches, okay? So I got that right there. So my shim is 0 0.06. That's the one I have that came with the engine is 0 0.06 inches. And I found my feeler gauge measurement came up with 0 0.02 inches, okay? So that's how much gap I have. My, now my goal, as you can see, my specifications are going to be 0 0.0025 to 0 0.0135. Um, so my goal is always to try to get as close as I can to the lowest number of my specifications. So for me, that's going to be 0 0.0025 inches. Okay. So I'm going to take the, the feeler gauge measurement and I'm going to minus my goal. And then that gives me 0 0.0175 inches. Okay. Now, if you remember, my shim is 0 0.06 inches. So if I take the difference between these two and I add them together and I add that to my existing shim, I'm going to end up with 0 0.0775 inches. Now, they don't make shims that specific they're basically they basically come in um 0 0.07 0 0.075 you know they're all in fifth so um you know 0 0.065 0 0.06 um so then at that point you have to figure out what's the biggest one you can get in there and so i have 0 0.075 is my target to achieve perfect you know a perfect uh shimming and i can only get them in 0 0.075 or 0 0.08 so in this scenario i would always choose the smaller one because again i'm going for the tightest gap so i choose the smallest one that i can you know of the two because if i went to this one it would actually be too tight it would be tighter than this number. So I go to this one and then that's the number. Okay. You just, and then you just order up, you know, Eastern EMS, Eastern motorcycle parts makes shims in 0 0.07, 0 0.075, 0 0.08. And so then you just order up, you know, the correct size shim that you need. And then you're going to be, you know, you're going to be within spec because you got it as close as you could to your goal. Um, so that's the math behind this.